Hello, animators and artists, and welcome to another Toon Boom interview. We are currently featuring the creators who contributed to the demo videos accompanying the launch of Harmony 20. Today, we're speaking with Arthel Isom, the founder of the anime studio De Art Stagio. He is also a talented background artist who was so deeply moved by the art in Ghost of the Shell that he physically relocated to Japan to study the craft and work in the industry. If you're joining us on Twitch, we are currently live. So if you have any questions for Arthel, please let us know in the chat. All right, uh, Arthel, what are some of the projects that you've worked on either at De Art Stagio or throughout your career? Um, okay, so hello everyone. Um, I've been in Japan now, I guess, for 15 years. So I've worked on quite a few projects. Um, from my earliest, I guess the earliest things I worked on, actually the first animation, the animated series I worked on was Triple X Holic. Um, I worked on the last three Naruto films, I think, or unless there's one that I'm just not aware of. I mean, um, I've worked on Naruto's TV series, both of them, Ropuri and the Shippuden series. And um, I've worked on quite a few Japanese feature films, A Letter, a letter to Momo, um, Gothic Maid. Um, something that I really liked working on was um, one of one of the that I wanted to work for was like, Katsuhiro Otomo. But he had a short that came out called Short Piece, so I worked on that. And and then that was individually. And once as Dara Stagio, also we worked on quite a few Japanese animated shows. We worked on uh, One Piece, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, um, most recently uh, Attack on Titan and um, Fire Force, I think it's the American title or the English title. And we work on a number of um, shorts and commercials and music videos and things. Uh, so speaking about the project uh, that you worked on for Harmony 20, uh, what was the prompt that you were given and how did you interpret it for your scene? Okay, um, so the prompt, so when, when we got the project from Harmony, they had given us um, quite a few choices and the one that we decided to go with was, um, let me see if I can remember, you can be who you are, you can show your true you. And, um, and then we were trying to, so I, I chose that one because I thought it sounded cool. But then actually when we had to, try to come up with something to, to go with it, it was it was pretty difficult um, because we had, I think the, our, the amount of time we had was six seconds. So we're trying to show how can we show, you know, you can show your true you in six seconds. And um, for us, story is really important. We were trying to figure out what, we, we definitely wanted the story, that, that story to come across. And we thought about quite a few different uh, um, events and uh, kind of social issues and things and just kind of uh, different things going on right now that we thought kind of embodied that theme and then the one that we landed on that we decided to go with was with um, this kind of representation of the uh, LGBTQ um, community and um, we um, we just felt that like that was a perfect way to kind of really get get this theme across and then also we thought it would be just an amazing um, idea and chance for us to express a character that that we don't rarely see even on like live action in general tv so we thought that this would be a great animation animated character to, to try and go with that yeah I, it can be really challenging to convey uh, a story in six seconds um so i, I guess uh, what are some of the uh, details in the background, and how do they inform us about the protagonist? Um, so, with so sometimes, like being the background artist, I kind of get really, I get really into um, designing the backgrounds and really thinking about it because I feel that the background are uh, is, you know, often forgotten in, in animation and just in, in the industry in general, though it's so very important. Like our environment tells us everything about the character. Even even our when you think about reality, like our rooms, our office spaces or anything, the things that we have on our desks, the things that we um, have in our house or in our bedroom, they tell us who we are, you know, because the you we got we buy the things that we that we like. And so that tells us, oh, these are my hobbies. So you can you can kind of know people without even having to know people, without even having been introduced to them, just by walking in their space. At least that's how I feel. And I feel that way about um, the environments when, when I'm painting environments. 
And um, I want to try our, my best to tell as much information as I can about the character, about the scene, about what we're about to see, because the, the backgrounds gives us a chance to set that up with lighting, with um, with with the, with, scene, with the things that we see, with the structures and objects that's in the scene. Um, you know, we can know if this is a war or if this is a, you know, takes place in the past or if this takes place in the future. All of that is told through the background. And so when it came, when we had to think about uh, this six second um, short piece for the commercial, um, we decided like, okay, well, <clears throat> how are we going to use this background to help um, ex express this character and tell this story, this this six second story, and um, so we use the background to um, to really help to get people to get an understanding of who this character is, and um, and also to just kind of get an idea of like you know how does this character live it's like their their everyday life and how do they uh, um, like what things do they like and all, all those those were all the things that we we're trying to think about when we we're coming up with with the character. Like um, I'm like rambling. I don't know if I should go in more detail. For the I, I, I love the detail. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I like you mentioned that uh, the background is something that goes overlooked. When uh, usually when you're watching animation, it is the largest part of a, a scene. You know, most mm -hmm. of what you see is background. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, what are some of the details in the background that uh, inform who the character is? Okay, yeah, like, so with this character, um, so as we mentioned, we decided to, to tell a story, or we decided to show uh, a character from, like, the LGBT community, LGBTQ community. He's, his true self is this, um, you know, this woman that he's kind of wants to be. And, like, we, so when, when we were thinking about the backgrounds to help us to decide this character, I think in the, I think in this short, even though it's, a, it's only six seconds, I think there are three backgrounds that show up. And like they're all the same backgrounds, the same room, but they're from different the different angles of the room. And so we were trying to decide like, and I think that that was actually the the, the hard thing because we were like, okay, what kind of room would this character be in? You know, what what would be in their room? And we didn't want to just have the room look like a girl's room because I felt that that was kind of unfair. And then like if we just had a look like a boy's room, I felt that that was unfair too. And I felt like that there that there was this like in between space, you know, like which I think that's the kind of the conversation that like you know where like gender doesn't have to kind of determine who we are, what we do, and things like that. And so, like I felt like, and so like I don't know if I was just kind of asking myself too many questions or anything like that when we were going over the background, but those are the things that we were thinking about when we were trying to come up with it, what this space that the character would be in. So some of the details that we put in there are. Um, so we decided that the character likes basketball, and um, and and we also decided that the character uh, loves sewing. So my I, uh, one of our staff members they had they they recommended that we uh, that yeah if this if this character is transgender he's most likely going to be like sometimes making his own clothes and he would have and she would have like uh, you know she would have a wigs like all that all of you know her room because she'd be wearing different wigs and things. And I thought that was interesting. So we put like a sewing a sewing machine in her room. And then we put a, uh, um, and we, the dress that she's wearing and when she transforms is uh, is the dress that's in the background. You can see that she was making it. So it's kind of like like small details like that. So we have the, the actual cloth in, in, the, in the sewing machine. And we have um, like butterflies on the wall. So that's one thing that I really liked about Harmony. First, it's like you can just set your color palette. So I, I would set the color palette, and I, I set the color palette. Once I set the color palette, um, I would then send that out to everyone. Or I set it. I, would, I set up the file, and let's see if I can open it up for you. And, um, and then everyone can just use the same color palette that I had kind of already set up. But of course, the color palette isn't. Um, it's not the final color palette because you can't have like a, a finished color palette until you have the backgrounds and everything in the sequence. But we're already kind of like normally in her and you're, you know, we're kind of working on both things at the same time. So we'll go through and we'll have the, um, the animators will be coloring and animating and, and then we'll, uh, um, while they're, while they're animating the sequences, then we'll be painting the backgrounds and things as well. And 
Sorry. Well, so what I did was we would set up the like just a base color palette, and then we would send that to we put that into Harmony because we can set up the the file. We'd have everyone look through it. They can choose their colors and color their way. And then some of the tools that I really liked about Harmony that I really like in Harmony is that once I put the backgrounds in, I realized that okay, actually some of our uh, colors are still um, off, and so. And then so because some of our colors were still off, we I had to readjust the colors. But the, the great thing about Harmony is that you don't have to um, try to re readjust the colors individually. You can just readjust the color palette. And mm -hmm. This is my compositing sequence, so my color palette is not here. <laughs> um, what was the most technically or artistically challenging element of your scene and what are you the most proud of? Um, I think the most the kind of the most challenging part of the sequence was just trying to figure out who the character was actually mm -hmm. and um, and then how do we show that? So that that was actually the I think that, that probably was the most difficult part for us because we although the character itself is just a normal like um, and the animation of the character, we would um, we would we 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 constantly questioned ourselves about how would this character move, like what does the character look like, and so coming up with the design of the character, I think it was very challenging for us. Like we we didn't want this character to just kind of look like a boy, and we didn't want the character to just look like your like your stereotypical girl, and which is like those that's like the the easiest thing to do. Like when you, if we were thinking about like a transgender character. Okay, cool. We just we just drew a girl character and put her on the screen, and we, w we really wanted to uh, make sure that our character represented that part of the community and represented who she was supposed to be, and so we really had to think about like what her, what the character looked like, and so. So that like we we tried to really focus on the the physical features and the characteristics of the character, when we were going through the character, and. <clears throat> When we were going through just a kind of the design process, like okay, when when she is in her in the male form, like what what does she look like? What parts of this form are still left over, are like still present when she's in the in her woman form, and 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 just trying to make sure that she still looked the same, and and both that that was the kind of thing. Like of course, like it's. It's this character who becomes this character, so we, we didn't want it to just look like it became a totally different character. So that that was really difficult for us to, to kind of come up with, just trying to make sure that that the character really embodied um, that the the image and the characteristics and the person that we were trying to portray in in this um, sequence. Yeah. Uh, so, how would you say overall uh, the sequence compares in scope to a typical project at Day Art Stagio? Um, at Day Art, like I think, like well, generally our pipeline because we already use Harmony, that, so that's part of our normal uh, pipeline. So most of those things are the same. And <clears throat> so I'm just going to close this. As it doesn't come open. Okay, so like our normal pipeline was the same, but there was the one thing that was different is that this one, because this project was much, it was a short one, so we had to kind of like, we, we had to try to tell the same type of story and spend the same amount of time and things that we spent a much longer feature, like our much longer productions in like this really short amount of time. And, um, and then also with this particular production, we did the whole thing in harmony from beginning to from beginning to end. Our normal productions, depending on if we're working with companies on the outside as well, we would we would be relying on their pipeline. So we, we might have to um, you know consider what software and things that they're using and then we would work we would work with them. So generally because of that, we would stop we would do all the way up into animation in harmony. But then the post production, which is just typically like editing and uh, compositing, would all be done outside of harmony. But with this production we did because it was all done in-house we did the whole thing in harmony all the way up into compositing, and so um, so that that was that was a little bit different, and um, and it was it was kind of good because we can kind of we got to explore a few new tools and we got to try some new um, 
um, extensions and things that we didn't know were there. Like one of the one of the features that we were trying to figure out. Actually, that was in the, the in the window that I just opened. That was the black thing that appeared in the middle. It, we were trying to figure out how they get the mirror to really look like a mirror, and um, and so like um, we I think that that is the only difference. So like just we got to do the whole production in harmony from beginning to end. Which, so that, that's like the major difference. Other than that, everything else is the same, which I kind of like about Harmony is that it really does um, it because it's like sometimes you open up software or something and it's just so different and then we can't and then our pipeline is just totally all, like screwed over because of that. But like it was like, oh, OK, cool. We, we're normally doing this process already. And so when we use Harmony, we're just still just doing the same process and just in Harmony. So it, it was actually like there weren't any major differences really. It was more like, okay, cool. Now we're just doing everything in harmony. So that was good. This is a more general question, but what do you enjoy most about the work that you do? Um, enjoy most. Uh, I think I enjoy the creative process, like really coming up with ideas and um, trying to kind of deep to come up with the world or kind of like I like that I like the development the process and I think that I like the most so coming up with stories um like create creating things in, in any aspect of it I guess really and then I would say of course that like, being in the background it's like I love painting and you know really just sitting down and just kind of really seeing the the scene that we imagine coming to life uh, my colleague spoke br brief briefly with you a few months ago about how you and the team at Dart Stagio uh, was adapting to the coronavirus pandemic. Do you have any advice for studios that are concerned about the safety of their staff? Um, so I think, of course, all studios should definitely always be concerned about the safety of their staff. <laughs> that's, that's really important. And um, Japan, we've kind of found some good ways to kind of deal with it and they're we're in the middle. We're in Shinjuku. So we're in the city, which is actually the um, the hot spot of Tokyo, I guess. But we're, but our numbers are kind of fairly low, and the things that we do is we just kind of stay conscious of. Um, well, we have our staff stay conscious of when they go outside and things. So we're always wearing masks, and we make sure that everyone has a mask on, and that when they come back in, that they wash their hands. So like something we have our staff do. Yeah, just kind of really being. Um, clean, I guess. Like, yeah, once you come inside, wash your hands, also use alcohol. So I think companies can put like alcohol um, like dispensers and things like that in various locations throughout their office. You'll see that actually just throughout Japan, you go in department stores and things. So in our in our office, we have it at the entrance, near the sink, at the bathroom and on the tables. And so generally, like no matter where you're in this office, there's like an alcohol, like a small um, local dispensary. We have like the alcohol wipes and we kind of set up rules for our staff. So when they come in, they have to wipe down their desks and things with alcohol. When they leave, they wipe down their desks and things with alcohol. And um, even when we're like just as small of a thing, when we take up the phone, like if the phone rings, our staff will, um, you know, wipe the phone and then, you know, talk. And then once they finish, they wipe the phone again and hang it up. So I think just kind of, if, if you have your staff just being conscious, like being aware of the things that they need to do to keep themselves safe, and, and not only themselves, but something that I really like about Japan and just here is like we're everybody's kind of aware of everyone else. So if we have a cold, for example, we're already used to wearing masks, but the mask wasn't to keep us from getting sick. It was so that we don't make everybody else sick. And so like we're kind of kind of always just keeping that at the forefront of everyone's mind. Like, okay, cool, like, everyone make sure you wear a mask, make sure you clean things because we don't want to make everyone, we don't want to make someone else sick. But I think if companies do that, they'll, they can kind of um, rest a little bit. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a great answer. Uh, so we're just over uh, 20 minutes into the interview. Uh, so if you're just joining us now on Twitch, I'm speaking with Arthel Isom, at De Art Stagio about his work on the scene that uh, was contributed to the Harmony 20 launch video. We posted prompts for questions on social media for Arthel. Uh, so here are a few questions from our followers about producing anime in Japan. Uh, we saw that your team highlighted a post on Twitter uh, from a user named Close Stars. 
Uh, and it, it's actually a multi-barreled question, so I'm just going to give it to you one at a time. Uh, the first one is, how do you become an animator or storyboard artist for uh, anime studios? Okay. So, yeah, like we have an animator and storyboard artist. So those, those two are different positions. And so depending on which um, position you want, like I always kind of say, the best thing to do is just to know ex exactly what you want to do. So let's say, for example, you decide, okay, I want to be an animator. So the steps that are necessary for that are, um, you know, are, are different than what, what, what you need to know for a storyboard artist. As an animator, you want to kind of be a good draftsman. You want to have, uh, you want to be, um, you want to be really aware of motion and timing and being able to, um, so that when you draw a character that you can figure out how, how this person moves. So sketching a lot, practicing a lot, drawing animals, people, like vehicles. Um, also for animators, it's important to understand perspective because um, uh, animators like need to constantly consider that like you, they don't just draw like a character, like we have to kind of put the character in space. And so if they like think about where this character is going to be in the space and um, so just kind of being aware of those things. And I think if you're as an animator, if you if you want to be an animator, if you practice those things, I think that's kind of the good path to be an animator. For a storyboard artist, you actually don't have to learn how to know how to draw. You can um, you, you can just kind of like uh, the, the main things for a storyboard artist is telling a story. So having a really strong sense of telling story, what a story is, the, the, the plot points of a story, if you're going to do a three-act structure, five-act structure, depending, either one is okay. But um, and then like being able to make sure that that like comes across in, in it. And st storyboard artists are also kind of like cinematographers in a sense. So understanding cinematography, like, you know, where do you place the camera, um, medium shot, close up shot, or you know, wide shot, you know. Also, composition is super important. So th those, I think that like I just kind of touched on it. Like there are of course way more things that are necessary, but yeah, knowing what what you want to do, and then studying those things that's necessary for each of those for for the part you want to enter. Yeah, it really helps to know the the, the language of cinematography if you're going to be a storyboard artist. Yeah, uh, yes. another part of the question was, uh, do you already need to know someone in the business? And uh, we spoke about this briefly before the stream. So uh, I, I really like your answer to this one. OK, so yeah, yeah, like the, I, don't know if, I don't even know if I can repeat exactly what I said. But like, I think, uh, yeah, generally, I always kind of ask people to kind of think about it differently. So like to rephrase the way you think about that, because I think people have like this negative uh, impression of oh yeah you need to know someone in the industry like it's not what you know it's who you know kind of thing and then and they have like this really negative way of thinking about it like oh i can't get in the industry you know the only people who are there is because they know somebody and that's the only way they got in and and it's tr that part of that is true but it's like a really but it's a very nuanced answer and i think the, the i would prefer the way that i kind of hope everyone will look at it is that yeah knowing people is super important and it's not and what it is is what that really means is just networking is important, communication is important, like getting out and getting to know people. Because uh, most of the people that like even now, my experience of like people who, that I've come across in the industry, like a lot of my classmates are working and I, I get work from my classmates. Like people are like, oh, okay, yeah, I went to school with Arthel. And so both of us just started out as students. Like neither one of us were important, neither one of us were famous or anything. It was just that we just happened to be at the same school and both of us were working and st are studying. And then we, we were friends and we kept in contact just enough to then you know, oh, oh wow, like now he's working. Maybe I can reach out to him. He might have a job for me. And, that, and that's kind of what a lot of this kind of boils down to is really just putting yourself in a position to really get to know people and to to not only, uh, like I think artists kind of have this tendency to just really just get, you know, into, uh, you know, staying in your room or something and drawing all day, but like really get out there and go to conventions and, you know, whenever the, if there's an artist in town or there's a company in town for portfolio viewing or any anything and, and just get out there and, and talk to people. And not only, I think a lot of people try to talk to the famous people or the people who made it already. Like, not only that, like, talk to the people who are going to the convention. 
because those are the people who are going to be in the industry next and those are going to be the industry leaders next and so it really does just mean to make friends you know make friends network and talk and you know and that that is how you get the job or get at least put yourself in a better position to be able to get jobs besides just on you know sending out your portfolios and things like that <clears throat> And uh, the last part of this question was, uh, what portfolio requirements are uh, Anime Studios looking for? Uh, so, I think that kind of depends on what you want to do. So, kind of like what we what we talked briefly about earlier, like because depending on what you want to do, your portfolios that's going to change the type of portfolio that where that each of the studios are going to be looking for. So. Definitely tailor your portfolio to, to the type of job you want. Like you don't want to kind of have your resume say, I want to be an animator, but then you submit a portfolio that just shows you with a whole bunch of landscape drawings, because that's not going to get your job. Like you, that, they're going to be really confused. Like, okay, wait, this person paints really well, but you know, so definitely determine or decide what you want to do. And then that is what you're going to focus your uh, portfolio on. And then, um, the next thing is determine. So I kind of say like there's like three things. So one is yeah, figuring out what job you want to do, and then making sure your portfolio is is tailored towards that. But then the next thing is um, also figuring out which company you want to work for, because the the companies depending on which company you want to work for, the portfolio review is going to be totally different, just because the look of the company is going to be different. Like if you want to work in anime, I guess for example, the, the two companies I could think of with the with very different looks are like, for example, well, Production IG, of course, um, you know, very realistic, very pale colors, muted tones, and things. The characters, motion, and stuff is is kind of real, and and they actually don't even have like the big like anime eyes or anything. They're very realistic characters. But then you um, might think about like uh, like Kyoto Animation or um, a, a one pictures or something like that. And there's a very colorful, very bright, um, a Kyoto animation really focuses on school girls, you know, like young, young girls, high school stories and things like that. And so, whereas like production IG focuses on like, you know, future in like very drama, dark, dark um, animations and things. And so, you know, just that telling your portfolio to the company will also help you when, when they look at your portfolio, they'll be like, oh, okay. Yeah, this they they can then envision you with their staff, whereas like yeah, like if your work just looks totally different, then they might even though you're good, they might just not they might think oh you won't fit with what what theirs with that company's image is. And then the the last thing, the third thing is, um, I was kind of I don't want you guys the people who are who are listening to this to take this the wrong way, but um, to have a very realistic outlook about your current abilities. And so when you when you look at your uh, when you look at your portfolio, determine like you you can kind of tell if you're good enough. So for example, and I don't mean good enough to work, because there there is always a company that you can work at. But it's just making sure that when you submit your portfolio, that it is one of the companies that you can work at. And so if you're at like, let's just say there's like three tiers of artists, right? Just for the sake of argument, we have beginner, intermediate, and advanced artists. The advanced artists can apply for like to Pixar and they can apply to Disney and they can apply to production IG or something like because those are advanced artists they're really good now then maybe and I'm not going to say any companies names for the other ones I'm just going to only say they're really good companies because I don't want I don't want the companies to kind of I'm comparing them but yeah but then you got intermediate style companies and you have like you know the very beginner companies and I might say like for example beginner companies are the studios where they're like not realistic characters very like maybe just kind of and not even realistic motion, you know, and, and and you might think, but I don't want to work there. But I'd say the best thing is like getting through the door because you can get experience from working in the industry. So the main thing is like if you just like you tell your portfolio to the skills that you have at that moment. And then if you get that job there now, three or four years later down the line, you're going to be way better because you've been practicing. And of course, in, maybe in the back of your mind, you do want to work somewhere else. But now you're working, you're going to get experience working in industry or understand production pipelines, you understand everything. And then you can then next, try to go for that next tier of companies. And, and, you know, you might then get it. So whereas if you just submit your portfolio to like an advanced tier company right away, they're, they're just going to like say no, maybe. 
and then that'll be and then you know you might have your dreams dash and then that's it so you know kind of yeah just kind of have a realistic outlook of your current um your current you know position and a bit skill set and you might ask like okay well how do i know what my current skill set is um i think it's you know you, what you can do is think about the companies that you want to work at or for and then um you know look at the artwork that's coming from that from those studios and when you look at the artwork that's coming from those studios look at your work and put it put them next to each other you know and you're not comparing it you're like you're not saying oh well, this because that's not what it is but what you are doing is just kind of you're looking at the the, uh, the level of not the level but just what it looks like what does your work look like mm -hmm. what does that work look like and if they don't look the same you know then you're like okay yeah maybe i'm not here just yet you know, then yeah, then choose an, another another company. You know, and that those would be the advice that I would give about this. Ah, oh, shoot! I'm gonna put away my application for Studio Ghibli then. Yeah, yeah, um, Jim. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so I, I saw we had a chat in the uh, a comment in the chat, uh, which is, um, what can affect uh, deadlines? Uh, what effect can deadlines have on your animation and what workarounds do you find are useful to save time? Okay, so yeah, deadlines are crazy. <laughs> Schedule, you know, schedules, it's crazy because of course like all artists, uh, that was really, like all artists want to have like, um, you know, work and you want to just be able to draw forever without having to, you know, worry about a deadline. But, but deadlines are part of the industry, right? But that, especially if you're a commercial artist. If you're a fine artist, like you know, throw to your heart's content, and then that's that. <laughs> but like when, but if you're if you're a commercial artist, a deadline is that's kind of what we have to deal with. You know, all productions have a schedule, and we have to kind of think about the, the amount of time you have. And so, yeah, and like when you have a short schedule, there's only but so much you can do in that. So I think it's like trying to figure out what what is possible within the amount of time that you have and then choosing the proper uh, work work method so that you can still complete this that deadline and then what what you can do like you know that I, I think it, you have like as artists we have to kind of think about what we want to do because of course we all want to do just like amazing things and things and then we and then we have to also think about what's what's just doable and like uh so i think with deadlines that that's the thing that 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 really gets affected is like um you know we sometimes can't do what we want to do like even though we might have like this really grand vision of something and you know but we're like oh but the deadline just doesn't allow us to do that you know um but you know but deadlines aren't a negative thing it's just something that we have to kind of be aware of and um, yeah, i think if, yeah no, that i'm not totally sense. sure if i answered your question but yeah. Uh, no, I think that I think that answered that. Um, Crystal Collado on our LinkedIn page asked, uh, "What surprised you the most about starting a new anime studio in Japan?" Um, you know, like so. Yeah, I've been in Japan now for fifteen years, and so I started I started my company at the latter part of that time. So, like you know, because of that, I've been in Japan so long that when I started there. I don't think I was really surprised by anything in particular because I, I was already so used to just the way the culture works here and I already kind of understood what things would be necessary and like what I could kind of expect from, um, you know, just kind of the culture and work, the work environment and things like that. So I don't really have any um, surprises from that. What I did have, of course, is just like surprises from just having a company, though. You know, like there's so many surprises, like you know, things that you just don't consider. And when you start a company, I think that like you, of course, you try to uh, to think about everything, right? Like all, all the possible like places that you can kind of have like you know make a mistake or something or you know like okay all my bills paid or something like that you know but like there's always something that's just going to pop up that you just didn't can, that you didn't think about you know and, and you're like wow like, that's crazy like um, i don't know like paying taxes or something you know like and like the comp and you have to pay taxes for like all, all of the not not your only employees but everyone even outside outside of the company that was kind of surprising to me and so like you know and then that you know so there's there's things like that i think only the company has way more surprises than it just being in, in Japan. 
another question that we have is, uh, what does the production process look like in anime, and how is it similar to or different from 2D Western uh, animation projects? Um, yeah, Japan, so for the most part, the I'd say the fundamental part of the production is the same, right? Like um, animation is animation, like the basic pipeline is the same. There's pre-production, production, post-production, post you know, storyboarding, um, then you go through uh, like character designs, world designs, rough animation, um, cleanup in between, and then compositing and editing. But, um, but Japan has like this way of like just making things complex like i think japan is a master of like just making everything complex they, they i think they like i don't know like i i almost think that that's like that they have fun trying to figure out ways to just make it harder <laughs> but but you know but the great thing about that is like it helps i i definitely see the difference in the look of the style because of that so japan has very minute uh or like nuanced positions that are in between all of the positions that are in the West. So whereas like the West would have, okay, rough animation to clean up, Japan has like rough rough animation, uh, secondary rough animation, and then they have uh, animation director check, which is in between both of those two steps. And then, and then we have clean up, which is after that, you know? And so there's like these small steps in, in between every step to kind of, um, you know, to tailor their production and make sure that it just, you know, that the quality is as, as high as it can be and that um, it, it's where it's supposed to be, I guess. And I think th that's really the difference, though. And because American animation and Western animation is not, it's not to say that, oh, Western animation isn't, doesn't have the high quality that, that Japan does because it, you know, of course, Western animation is amazing and there are amazing studios there. It's just, it's just a different process, though. Like, how, how do each of those studios what steps do each of those studios take to get to that amazingness you know? and, that, and that's the difference i guess yeah you were also telling me before that uh, a lot of roles in uh japanese animation are more specialized so uh -huh. uh, you might have in like western productions you might have somebody who's doing the keyframes and then the breakdowns or in-betweens and it doesn't happen so much in Japanese productions. Uh, two questions from Animate Sam in the chat, and I think they tie into what you're just saying. Uh, one is, uh, is the Art Stagio uh, working with uh, studios in the West or Canadian animation studios, American animation studios? Uh, do you work with freelancers in North America? Um, yeah, we, we work with um, quite a few freelance artists. We work with um... We do work with other studios in the West. Like one of the studios that we recently worked with was uh, Powerhouse, who we helped with, mm -hmm. uh, with with Castlevania, and um, and as goes with freelance artists, we work with one of the projects we're working on right now. I think we hired some artists in in Europe, and we worked with an artist from the States, and and one artist in in Germany, and so we work with like not a lot of freelance artists, but depending on the scope of the production and. Um, and just timing and uh, yeah, like the kind of work. So we look at people's portfolios and sometimes if, if what they said matches what, what the work that we're about to kind of embark on, then we'll, we'll reach out to them. Yeah, and uh, part two of their question is, is there ever a culture shock when a worker outside of Japan tries to work with anime deadlines uh, or processes uh, that you know, and uh, do you have any advice for that? Uh, yeah, so let's see, culture shock. Let me see, would it be culture shock or like pipeline shock or something? I don't even know what it would kind of <laughs> fall under. But yeah, so when we work with Western artists, it is actually really difficult sometimes. And so much so that sometimes I'm just like, oh, I'm not going to hire any more freelance artists anymore <laughs> but because it, it's so different, you know? And so, where because of the the so the advice that I would have is when the artists or freelance artists are coming to work for a studio in Japan, please be very open to that to that company's process because the process is so different. And so I think most of the artists will, will or most of the studios, the production managers and things will explain their process to the artists. But I think a lot of the uh, the Western artists think that it's not necessary and they're like oh no we don't i don't need because they're not thinking past that step so i say like be just be conscious and be aware that yeah there's a reason that these that these steps are being explained to you and and if you don't understand it 
ask like a thousand questions and you until you do understand it because what's going to happen is even though you might be like a really good animator or a good artist and then you submit your work but because your work didn't didn't um reach the steps that was required now you're actually making way more work for the artist here because we have to essentially correct everything that you did which like can set the production back and so what that means is they, we just won't hire you again right so now like you're like this great artist who could have been working on like more and more productions but like you know because of the culture shock or just be not like being used to the the rules that that we're asking or the not the rules but the steps that we're asking you to follow then you know now you, you don't do those things but then not doing those things then you know um stops you from being able to work again you know so yeah i'd, I'd say like just be very open and be like willing to change your your process and uh, be willing to learn so definitely if you're reaching out for a studio say it doesn't have to be japan but if you're say oh I, I love french animation or i love chinese animation and you want to work in china like then definitely research that culture and that country like you know now there's youtube and twitter and everything you can go on twitter and you can follow favorite art animators and you can look at their work and a lot of people put process up online and so if, if that can kind of help you so that when you do reach out to these studios that that will lessen that kind of culture shock right because you're already going to be kind of aware of what is required like something i noticed is that a lot of artists will just say oh i'm a good artist and then okay i'm going to reach out to these people but they have like no understanding of like what they, they, these companies do or how they do their work or anything and, like i i think now be, just because like even now there's this this um you know we're doing this live stream where you can ask questions and things there's so much information out there that that on the other side we expect the artist to kind of have a basic understanding so yeah but it's a really long answer and i apologize for that <laughs> but yeah yeah well in that vein what are some of the different roles in anime production uh, i saw that uh, a user called bip bap b on twitter was asking uh, about the differences between a director an episode director a storyboard or an animation director um, so, so, so what are some of the different roles that people should be aware of? Um, let's see. So there's like quite a few different roles and, and, and then animation production, probably like way too many to kind of list here, but like I can kind of go through some of the major ones, I guess. So, and you, so you mean like all of the directors and everything just within the animation production pipeline only or? Yeah, let's go for it. Okay, so uh, let's kind of start from the top, I guess. So you have the director, and then underneath the director is the technical director. Oh, so sorry, let me just give a brief explanation of what they do. So the director, of course, is in charge of the whole production. The director's vision, the director has the, uh, the director decides the direction that, that this production will go. And the uh, um, the director, which means that the director sees, oversees everything gener generally. So like, you know, like, okay, I, I want the characters to look like this. I want the world to feel like this. I want the story to feel like this. It doesn't mean that the director does everything, but they just kind of decide what things should look like. And then, um, so that's kind of what the director does. Then the technical director, at least in, J in Japanese animation, the technical director is the person who helps the director realize their vision. And so, uh, you know, because of, because the Japanese animation process is so complex, the technical director kind of helps the um, the director to kind of oversee things. And so, when when cuts are being turned in, or like some animation, when some animation sequences are being turned in from by certain artists, the technical director will also um, overlook them and with the director and take notes from the director about what he wants and then that the technical director would then give notes to those artists like oh this or he'll try to figure out what the director wants so sometimes this is why some people say that you technically don't have to be an artist if you're a director because the technical director will help you you know like the and the technical director will kind of draw things out for the director or the technical director will um know how what notes are required to get the desired effect that the director wants and that's kind of why they call it the technical director right he's like he really does like he like the all the technical aspects of animation the technical director should know and understand and then um then you you have underneath the technical director 
is the, I guess, the production manager. And of course, there's there's a whole bunch of little tiny steps in there, but I'm going to skip those kind of things, our tiny positions. But so then there's like the main production manager. The main production manager is the person who kind of keeps the schedule and the production on track. You know, they're, they're going through and making sure that all the different, all, everything that the director and the technical director have set out is being done, that like, that the different positions are being, um, uh, have, have been put in place to make sure that production moves forward. So it's like, it's um, the the production manager is like, okay, we need a storyboard artist, we need writers, or, or not writers, but um, animators, and we need background artists or something. And the production manager's job is to make sure that those positions are doing what they're supposed to do and that the work is being um, turned in on time and, and, and so on and so on. And then there's the, um, I don't know if the production, ma production manager is probably the animation director. And I don't know, like some people might say the animation director is like next to the technical director. I'm not too sure which one. I guess that just depends on the production and how great the animation mm -hmm. director is. But like the animation director's job in Japan is to make sure that the whole production is this looks the same and feels the same. And so um, they what they do is uh, they kind of like when when all of the work has been turned in, the animation director checks it and makes sure that the anatomy is correct, make sure that the characters are on model, make sure that the, the perspective is right. You know, they they really are checking the the overall scene and feel of it. And like, like you know, if one character is supposed to move a certain way or the lighting is wrong, like the animation director checks those things. The director and the technical director also check those things. But and then they give notes to the animation director to make sure that like, you know, that they, they kind of tell the animation director, this is what we want. And then the animation director checks everything to make sure that it's it's what they want, you know, kind of. And um, the underneath the animation director is the, um, I guess, then the animators. And then they did, I mean, they're, they're, this, the order isn't really any specific order. It's just kind of like now there's just a, other positions. So you have like the animators, you have the background artists. Uh, oh, sorry. So underneath the animation director, actually, there is a different position, which is not underneath the animation director, but maybe next to the animation director. That's the art director, and the art director decides the way that the world looks and the colors that are used. Um, the art director in Japan and the art director in the West are actually kind of different. In Japan, art director, which is like Bijis Kantoku, kind of means. Uh, uh, sorry, I guess I'm telling you something. So like, kan director is Kantoku, technical director is Inshitsu. The animation director is Hakuga Kantoku, and then the art director is the Bijis uh, Kantoku. And so the, Bijis, the art director's job is like to, in Japan, it really is just to paint the colors, and they decide the colors of the world and things. The art director doesn't actually always design the world. So that depends. That could be the world designer, like that. That's like a so like uh, Bijis Sete, and then that that could be a different position. So it depends, but. Like for example, at the art, um, I do both of those positions, so I can I design the worlds and decide the color of the worlds. But at other studios, sometimes that's like a different position. And then then you have the animators, and you have the background painters, and you have uh, the in betweeners, and the color artists, and the compositors, and and many many many. many. <laughs> yeah. Other than that. Yeah. So, so the one thing I really like about talking to uh, someone who runs a studio is that I get that really top-down view of all the different roles in a production, uh, and I, I really enjoy that. Uh, so we are almost out of time. Uh, so if anyone in the chat has more questions for Arthel, uh, now is the time to ask. Uh, one question I really wanted to ask you is uh, a user by the name of Emoji of a Lemon on Twitter asked, if you find that your studio tends to get more requests from Western markets or from uh, domestic requests in Japan? Uh, so our company focuses on on the West, but we kind of, uh, but we, I guess it's kind of balanced because of, it, it depends on the, um, on the, the production that we're doing. So we kind of do two different types of production where we're either assisting companies or we're doing the whole production from beginning to end. And when it comes to productions from beginning to end, we generally mainly work with the West, although we've, we've done a few things here where, we, where we've done it as well. And with, but with most of the studios here in Japan, we're assisting the, assisting the studios here with their productions. And um, I think 
so yeah, and, that's, and it's not really more from one or the other. It really is just kind of, uh, it, it really is kind of the same. Like, so where we, where we're assisting work in Japan, we might be doing just, for example, keyframe animation, or we might be doing just cleanup, or we're doing background paintings, or, or character designs, or something like that for the animation. Then in the West, when we're helping with the West, we would generally be doing like like everything, like creating the, the storyboards and the characters and the world and then doing the actual production. But we also assist companies in the West as well. And, um, and as we said, like you know, Powerhouse is one example of that. Hmm. Um, we got a question uh, from, uh, I believe the username would be said, uh, the March Hare. Uh, does the art uh, work in episodic anime or do you get involved in commercial animation? So advertisements or short form pieces? Uh, so we do both. And we're, of course, we're still like a, um, a, a small studio that we're still young studio. and We're moving towards being able to do our own episodic, like our own series. But right now we assist other companies with their series. And a lot of the productions that we take on on our own are short are uh, like music videos commercials like short form short form productions uh we got a question uh in the chat from emonia uh who first is thanking you for taking time to answer our questions which is always very nice uh and uh the question is uh are there any projects subject matter uh themes in particular that you would like to explore in the future in your work um yeah, actually, there's there's quite a bit. There's so so many. Like I think for our company, while we're trying to still figure out who we are as a company and like what what our what our voice is in the space of anime and in, and in just the medium of um, production and our in entertainment in general. And uh, like there are a lot of I think our our company we mainly focus on more realistic things. And that's a kind of our goal is more like adult oriented animation, like really just kind of having it so that it's not that anime is just viewed as an as a medium. And so uh, there are a lot of different genres that we would like to try to explore in anime and try to uh, tell. And of course, we're seeing a lot of more char different types of characters and telling different types of characters stories, um, like kind of both fantasy and also like true representation of characters. I think both of them are important and, and necessary. And um, also, so we, we like horror. So we haven't done any horror yet. So we do really want to do like, I don't know, we have some cool horror ideas. <laughs> and so I think that's something we're kind of looking forward to doing. All right, well, uh, Arthel, I want to thank you so much for joining us uh, for this conversation. Um, where can our viewers find more of your work online? Um, so, like, all of our uh, media, I guess, through all the social media, so we have, like, some sort of platform, our presence in all the different social media accounts and things. So if you, like, search um, for day, our Day Art Stagio, if you type in Day Art Stagio on Twitter, on YouTube, on um, Instagram, and on Facebook, and even just in the normal web browser, our company will pop up and we have different various like anime community animation communities where we answer lots of questions and post things and we have a vlog on youtube and yeah so please um go to any of any of your the different social media accounts and follow us and if you follow us on, on youtube click the bell something like that <laughs> yeah and uh, we'll make sure to include links on uh the uh, the chat uh, as well. So if you are looking to follow uh, the Art Stagio on uh, Twitter or on YouTube, uh, the links will be there. Uh, and uh, for our viewers, if you're interested in paperless frame by frame animation, you can download a 21 day free trial of Toon Boom Harmony on our website at toonboom.com. And be sure to join us next week for our last Q&A in this series with uh, a creator behind Harmony 20's demo video. We'll be speaking with Pinot on the rotoscope animation that he produced, uh, and as well as the bite-sized videos that he makes for audiences online. It'll be very interesting, and uh, we're looking forward to it. So until next time.